Get out. You are not welcome here. No trespassing. Do not enter. You are not included. Many of the Israelites may have felt that way when it came to the worship in the Old Testament. Church wasn't the same as the way we experience church today. Church was outside. The people were outside the building. God did not have them come inside. There was still this amount of separation. Yes, God dwelt among his people. When God did instruct them in his new style of worship from Mount Sinai and had them build the tabernacle, he also organized the tribes so that there were three on the south, three on the north, three on the east, and three on the west, so that all of them would still be around with God in the center, showing, I am here. But yet there was a separation. There was the curtains, there were the walls, there were the rooms that were set apart that the normal people could not come in. In fact, not even all the Levites. The Levites were the chosen tribe who would be the servants of the Lord at the tabernacle and at the temple later on when it was constructed. But not even all the Levites were able to enter in, only those who would be practicing and doing the things that were inside uh, of the temple, the, pre the priests. So if you were one of the lucky few who would be able to go in, and you walked in through the tabernacle, it was a pretty small, small tent, only 45 feet long, 15 feet wide. But you'd enter into this curtain into a relatively dark front room in which was very simple, plain. Just three things were in that room. Off to one side it would be the table of showbread, a gold table with 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The menorah candle which gave the room its light. And then off to the back, close to this other curtain wall that led into another room, would be the incense altar. And that's it. That's all that was in there. And the priests would go in there to do their prayers. But then there was that room the room that they called the Holy of Holies off to the side, uh, off to the back. And there was the curtain of separation that nobody else could enter in except one man once a year. That's it. And in the entire history of the Israelite people, very, relatively very few people actually got into that because being a high priest, the one person who would be able to enter into that room once a year, was a lifetime uh, job. So when he died is only when the next person would be the successor. So very, 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 very few people would ever enter into that room. And there was the Ark of the Covenant, the gold box that was God's throne. The mercy seat was the top cover where it shows the angels and the archangels with their, their wings reaching over the top. But this was a do not enter location. Why? Because God still wanted to communicate that there is a separation that is between him and the people. He wanted to show his holiness. And the people really got it, that sin is what separated them. It wasn't just being a special person or part of a special tribe, or part of a special family, but they knew it was more than that. Because they knew that through the sacrifices, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, there was a sacrifice almost every day when they were actually doing it right. And this would show that sins are the things that separate God and his people. So when the Hebrews was written... This would be a shock. The thing in this verse would be a real shock to the ear of a Jewish person who through centuries understood you don't go in there. And one of the things that he says in this verse is now you get to come in. This is what he says in Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. He says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain, that is his blood. 
Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, but not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. How much do we take advantage of this? Opportunity to now enter into God's presence. How much do we treasure this opportunity to come into God's presence? It's so easy to slip into the thought of, well, this is just what we do on Sunday mornings. This is just what we do on on Lent Wednesdays, uh, that we get to come in front of God. But do we really realize that we are coming in front of God? And what a privilege it is to be in his presence and that we don't deserve this privilege. It is our sins that still cause separation between us and God. Even Isaiah commented to the Israelites, because of your sins, says the Lord, I don't hear you. It is an honor and a privilege to be inside and not outside. And it's not because of anything we have done. It's not because of the distinct family we have been brought up in. It is only by the blood of Christ. If you noticed a theme as I was reading that section, it was all Christ being the reason for the people to be able to enter in, for us to be able to be inside and not outside. You know, there was that one time in the Israelite history, that one time a year where the people did get to see the opportunity to go into the presence of God. And that high priest would act as if it is not just him, but the whole people being able to come in. And one of the things is what he would do is he'd get a bowl and they'd take this blood of the lambs and then also blood of a goat. And they'd do this twice, once with each of their blood. And he'd take his, his finger, not just anything, but his finger, and he'd dip it on the Ark of the Covenant seven times. And he'd do this. And then he'd go out and he'd get the next animal's blood. And he'd, seven times. It was more than just seven drops of blood that Christ shed on our behalf. He gave his life. He gave everything. He gave up all his blood so that all of us could be cleansed. If you're anything like me, I was washed in baptism by just a sprinkle, but it was the entire of me and soul and body and everything that the Holy Spirit washed through baptism And you too. Completely washed, completely clean, completely holy now, able to enter into the presence of God, completely forgiven. You are holy now. That curtain that separated in the tabernacle, the holy place from the most holy place, the holy of holies in the back, was much larger in Jesus' day. The temple was magnified by a great amount when Nero built this new temple. Uh, And, in fact, the curtain was so much larger, too. The curtain was 25 feet wide and 60 feet tall in the thickness of the palm of your hand. And yet God made a dramatic symbol when, when Jesus Christ died by his invisible hand, cut that curtain And he gave us a new curtain. The author of the Hebrews told us, we enter in through a new way, through the body and blood of Christ. Jesus is our entrance. And we are purified whenever we come in. Which is a good reason why we have the confession of sins built right at the very beginning of our worship service. To remind us of everything that he has done. And when we begin our worship, 
name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to remind us of our baptisms, of being washed. It is all Christ that builds us up, forgives us, cleans us, and makes us able to come. And we can be here with confidence. We can pray with boldness. I mean, think of the prayers that were spoken on Good Friday evening, the prayers of the criminal that we heard. The, the criminal who, who knew that he was not worthy to be hanging next to Jesus Christ, his Lord, who knew and acknowledged that he was getting what he deserved, and yet was bold and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus responded, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're not worthy. No, today you will be with me in paradise. And the confidence that Jesus had in his father as he ends his life and says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The trust that everything that happened on your behalf was perfect. And he put it into God's hands and there it rested safely in the hands of the capable and strong father. These are your prayers. You too can come before as a high priest and boldly pray to God in anything and everything and trust from your birth all the way up till your death. Into your hands I commend everything, my life, my soul, all these things that I do and in the very capable and strong hands of your Father, he will bless it. I think it's very easy for us to get used to a lot of the comfortable things, living in American life, sitting in a church like this that is just beautiful and having the opportunity to worship God. Never remember that it is, never forget that it is an honor and a privilege to be in God's presence, not just here, but anywhere you have the word of God, anywhere he is with you. What a great and awesome blessing it is. Christ has washed you clean. He has made it so you're not out. You're in. Amen.